Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges as he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. You know, today is going to be, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to our episode today because I want to chat once again with Terry Hershey about a subject that I've been pondering and journaling on for several months. The subject is how you might manage fate. Yes, how you might manage fate. To begin with, think of your life as an ongoing process of becoming. And you are a driver in your becoming. And so in my mind, two primary choices or two, two primary factors influence everything that happens in your life. And those factors are fate and choice. Fate represents all that you cannot control in life, or at least you think you cannot control. And choice manages the impact of that faith and can even redirect it. I am advocating that you can maximize who you want to be right now, tomorrow, and the days after that. That's our discussion. If you're a frequent listener to the show, then you are already familiar with our always special guest, Terry Hershey. If you don't know Terry, he is a prolific writer of close to 20 books, conference keynote speaker, renowned landscape architect, and excellent spiritual advisor. Uh, so good to chat with. Let's bring, him, let's bring him on. Yo, Hirsch, what's up? Well, good to be with you. Good. It's always nice to have you here. You know, I want to get right into the show, and I thought we might begin our time today with you telling us about a session you did, I think, yesterday, which would have been Tuesday the 27th of September, and you did a session on burnout to a group of medical staff. Tell me about that. Phrasing I use is emotional hydration. Oh. The world we live in being so interesting because I was in California, I was in Northern California, and so in very in dry parts of the country people have their big bottles of water they carry. They get hydration, they get the hydration thing. It's a great metaphor for the fact that we need one of those for our emotional hydration too, because the world can dehydrate us. And hmm. when you're dehydrated, back to your introduction, you tend to react rather than choose. What does it take to, to be replenished so that you're at home in your own skin? I mean, there's some stuff around you that you cannot technically control, but you're at home in your own skin. So talked about that because it was with a group of people who their job is to run trials, people doing different new medicines for different kinds of cancers. And the people who come to the trials, I mean, this is basically they're praying for a miracle. They and are. These, these people who are the ones who are creating this and doing the trials, they want to be miracle workers. And then the family members who accompany the people who stay during the trials, you know, they're paying and watching and whatever. And every single person who is, is a part of the job, the ones that I talk to, they want the miracle. Obviously, that makes sense. Um, but it is an overwhelming task and can deplete you. And sometimes it takes a toll, and our, our winning record <laughs> isn't what we think it should be. Yeah. And, and then, you, you, you know, you have the cancer patients who <laughs> sort of think they're Google doctors. They Google everything. And they're telling doctors about therapies that, you know, are only done in Mexico or some of the, you know, and we're just not holistic and... You know, these it's so insulting to doctors, like they really don't pay attention to to data and new information that they're just so stuck in their in their ways. And I can't imagine that a healthcare worker having to put up with what are you doing this when the when Google says you should be having a completely different therapy. That's gotta yeah, be well, mind boggling. 
to a healthcare provider. Yeah, my favorite part about the retreat I did for them was I never mentioned the word Google once. <laughs> <laughs> So tell me, I like this emotional hydration. What would you say is the cause of burnout? You just described your medical team that you worked with, that, that much of what they had, they deal with that, that leads to burnout and, and you, you, sort of you're depression. Not at, your own skin. not at home in your own skin. If you're not at home in your own skin, then, you're, then there's a variety of things. You're either at the mercy of something or you feel like you're a victim of something you feel like you um, the weight is so heavy you have no choices. It's burnout. And you have no choices, and it is just going to be a rerun of the movie that you saw today. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so, but because all three of those scenarios, whether you're at the mercy of or your victim or the heaviness, in all three of those scenarios, you, you end up, get, you give up. Yeah. You're out of control. You have no say or control in the situation. You give up. That's, that's burnout. Give up. Some people give up physically, mentally, emotionally, you know. But you do. You just, you're done. That's it. And we, we see it in, any kind, in lots of places in life where it's very heavy and intense. And we wonder why some people make it and some people don't. The cause of burnout, it seems to me to be just total frustration and incapacitating. That You know you're not in a place that you want to be in, and yet there is no vision for a way out. It no. Is, well, yes and no. Yes and no. Because then, then that, re, that framing is simply about what's going on. In other words, the heaviness of the world around me. I can paint you a picture that's unbelievably dark about that. And it's not just that, because the burnout is not just simply about what I see, this tapestry around me can undo me. It's about resources inside of me. This, we talk to them about, is not how you frame what you see. It's about what you have inside of you replenishes capacity to make choices in that context. That's what we talk about. And that's emotional hydration. That's emotional hydration. Describe that more to me, emotional hydration. I love that. I love that idea. Oh, the being at home in your own skin. In other words, it's all about stuff that's going on around me that uh, that not only undoes, undoes me, to see it undoes me. Not only <laughs> does me, I'm either angry or I'm reactive or uh, I point fingers or whatever it is, um, I haven't done whatever it is to replenish me. So we talked about this. Tell me, talked about where are those places where you are at home in your own skin, called about the gift of sufficiency and the gift of enough. Is that a question or? Oh, that's what I said to them while we talked. Oh, about okay. It. Yeah. What where kinds of you... responses did you get? That's, that's a very curious but, but question. A lot of people... Instantly responded. I mean, literally everything from, if I don't take a walk, I'm not going to, in other words, I need to take a walk. And other, uh, other people say, a lot of them had to do with outdoors. People, it's time with my dog. People, it was a particular conversation with a friend that they had that they needed to have. In other words, a lot of people knew it. But uh, some people said, don't know. Really don't know. I don't know what that place is. Yeah, and they don't know what the future will hold, and so your projections of the future in in that frame of mind tend only to be negative, that it's just going to, at best, stay the same and likely get worse. Because, and what happens is you become, you actually start to shut down a little bit and close down, you know, to people and protect you your own spirit because can't be can't react in wholehearted emotional there's no wholehearted emotional response to it. how do we get but there I, terry how do we get to this emotional i mean so many you you, you, you know we are you know Alain baton wrote about this in the school of life in a couple of other of his writings that 
that we have great education on um, reading, writing, and and mathematics, but we don't uh, and arithmetic. Yeah, we don't. But we have no education on how to deal with our feelings, how to deal with emotions, how to deal with everyday, everyday life activities, how do we manage stress. You know, there's no education on that, and, and we expect that to come from parents, and our parents just simply aren't capable of doing it now because they weren't educated in it, and they're figuring it out as they go along, and so many don't figure it out well. What is left for the child except for just... You know, it, it's just a side of difficulty. I, and that's what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about what might your options be to, I hadn't thought about this until we done, till we started the discussion, but w- what might be, how do we manage burnout? How do we manage what we call fate? I wrote this. I want you to tell me what I, I read it at the beginning, but tell me what you think of this, how this occurs to you. This was something I wrote in another piece. In my mind, two primary factors influence everything that happens in your life, and those are fate and choice. Fate represents all that you can control, all that you cannot control in life, or think you cannot control, and change, a la Viktor Frankl, manages the impact of that faith and even redirection of fate and redirection. What does that does that mean anything to you, or is that gibberish? Okay, off the top of my head, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose. His attitude at any given set of circumstances to choose his own way, Victor Frankl. Yes, and Victor Frankl, absolutely. But, you know, but not all of us are going to go through Auschwitz or whatever. I'm not sure. I think he was in Auschwitz. The point is, he he wrote that in Auschwitz. I mean, mean, I'm I'm having complete absolute reconstruction of several parts of the condo I live in now, which is an absolute mess. It's not Auschwitz. That still applies to where I am now. But most of us don't go through that, you know, that distressing of a situation. We go through... Well, the, the level of distress has nothing to do with what he's saying. Ah, he's saying. talk to me. Nothing to do with what he's saying. It has to, because... That level of distress is different in different times, as you know. And we saw this happen. So I didn't go to war. I was drafted for Vietnam, but I didn't go. But my friends who've gone know this, so they've had that. But my friends who were at 9-11 know this. And so, and so there was a level of distress that could not, be a, could not have been experienced at any other time in anyone's life, their life. And yet some people responded differently than others what he's talking about. It has to do with the capacity inside of you to make those choices. You actually know this. You know this from from the vantage point of sports with your son. There is a a hydration thing. People who compete at different sports have a capacity to respond to different things in the sport not because of their skill level, but because how they have cultivated what's inside of them to respond to it. Let me tell you a story about that because that's really, and I'll tell an inside story about my son. You know, he's been seven years as a big league player. He's been a decade in the in the major leagues. And he is, as you and I know, but our audience doesn't know, He is considered by many of the very top experts in defensive baseball as the best defensive catcher in baseball, if not the best top five defensive catchers in baseball. But he's in the bottom two or three in hitting. So he fails daily at hitting. His batting average right now is 185, you know, but he leads he leads the league in defensive runs saved and in framing and catching, it puts him at the top of the game. So he has extreme highlights and extreme downside. Unfortunately, he doesn't listen to social media, doesn't read it or pay attention. So he doesn't have to listen to all the fans on him. As a matter of fact, he even got, even with his defensive prowess, he was booed in Pittsburgh by the fans that didn't want him to come up to play, uh, didn't want him to hit. It was, it was just a terrible situation. Now, you take a look at that and you say, guy's done. 
You know, I mean, you know, most of us with that kind of with that kind of reaction from so many people, you're done. And yet, you know what he is? He's right now with the Texas Rangers and he is the leader on the team, even though he's not playing that much because he came to replace the starting catcher who was hurt, but healed from the hurt much more quickly than they anticipated. So he's not playing as much, but he is still the leader on the team because, Terry, he knows how to deal with failure. And he talks to teammates about failure, encouraging them, don't worry about it, this is a game of failure. And it is his choice, his decision. He gets up in the morning, he says, okay, I'm not going to be able to perform physically for this team, I won't have the opportunity, but what do I need to do to be the best teammate to make this team win? That's his question. How can I be the best teammate? And he has come about where he says, and and the teammates stay, he's the leader on the team. They follow him. So he's taken, he has made a choice not to let these totally destructive, disheartening, and, and just horrible feelings, he's taken them. And he's been able to use them as strengths in his in his baseball career. And he will probably make tenure, which is 10 years in the game, he will probably make tenure with a batting average under 200. Uh, and, All because and, of and attitude. Not just attitude, Charlie, but capacity to make a choice. And he's making that choice from something inside of him, which is which is uh, there's something of him being at home in his own skin, which is significant. Flesh that out for me, will you? I mean, we talk about it a lot, and we, we've described it, but I think our I listeners to, would really if, help. If I, need to, if I need to be somebody, uh, 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 if I need to be somebody other than who I am to impress you, I'm not at home on my own. I'm somebody that I, that I say to the responses, I shouldn't be that way. I'm not at home on my own skin. How many people I, are, Terry? If I live with a sense of shame and or fear, I'm yeah. not at home in my own skin. Yeah. Uh, the percentage of that is what you call high. Who cares? Having to do with our topic today, Charlie, it's not about percentages. It's about the fact that it's possible. Oh, that's beautifully I still said. Still, I'm going to strike. I still am going to strike. I still am going to am going to not get a hit. I'm the best. I'm Rod Carew. I still, seven out of ten times, won't get a hit. There's something I want to read to you that I'm searching, so keep on talking while I'm searching for this for this piece that I thought was that is, well, is really impacting me. In the own skin. It's a lot of people say that to me when I, when I talk to conferences, and, and because it has to be, everything has, there has to be closure at the end of it. Oh, that's the irony of it. Even in the middle of the, the discombobulation and the seven out of ten not getting on bases, oh, I'll tell you a story. Let me tell you this story. So they're on a beach. There's, you've seen uh, sand dollars, right? People have seen them. But, but anyway, they're they're actually a live animal until we collected them and put them someplace. But it washed up on shore because of whatever the whatever the waves were in this part of the. But they were on the beach. But there's an old man. There. And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of sand dollars there on the beach. And there's a younger fellow there seeing this man pick them up and go throwing them back in the ocean. And the young says, what are you doing? And the man said, well, if they don't, they're here for too long, they will die. They need to be in the ocean. And the kid's saying, but thousands of them. Like, why do you do this? What's the point? The old guy picks up another sand dollar in the ocean says, well, it made a difference to that one. Yeah. That's, I, I love that story. That's a great story. Thank you for that. You know, here's, here's a reading that I had done, and this came from uh, 15th century. I believe it was written around 1450. It's by, called The Cloud of Unknowing. It's an anonymous author, and it's from the Christian mystics. And so he's going to bring up the idea of sinful, and, and, and I want us to thank you know, he says, any new thoughts or sinful stirrings. And, and, and I want to think, you know, distressing things that things are getting in the way of us moving forward. And it has to do with you talking about 
um, your being comfortable in your own skin with being comfortable with who you are and accepting who you are and not trying to prove yourself, not feeling like you have to prove your worth to other people. And here's what he writes. It happens that particular deeds of yours done pre previously, any things you've done previously, or any new thoughts or disturbing stirrings, keep on pressing them into your consciousness between you and God, and you must, I love this, vigorous, vigorously trample them on the fervent stirrings of love. And that love overcomes all of your disturbings, all of your distractions, all of your downside. Love overcomes them and tread them down beneath your, beneath your feet. And he closes with this. And then try to cover them with a cloud, with a thick cloud of forgetting, as if they had never been done by you or anyone else on earth. I love this cloud of forgetting. We are not, we have no access to the cloud of forgetting. You know, certainly not the cloud of unknowing, but we don't forget. And do you know, in the New Covenant passages of the Old Testament in Jeremiah, uh, the prophet quotes God saying, I will forgive their sins and I will remember them no more. We go back to God, you know, in sort of penance or, or repenting over our sins. And he's saying, what sins? I forgot them. And And we need to be able to do that to have to have um, being comfortable in our own skin is that we need to forget our shortcomings. And we have a hard time forgetting our shortcomings, and we have a hard time forgetting the impacts of faith, of faith, I keep saying faith, the impacts of fate and uncontrollable situations in our lives. I, I, I like that power of forgiving and the, and the fervent stirring of love. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I don't disagree with the forgetting part, but it's a two-sided coin, is that the forgetting is not so then therefore there's therefore nothing. It's the hydration part, it's the forgetting. In the hydration part, um, I, I, it's just, we're back to Victor Frankl now. I can look at this or I can look at this, and, uh, and both of them are real. If there's the capacity inside of me in terms of a choice and responsibility, moving forward and making a decision that's been replenished and nourished and I move forward meaning that other stuff that was supposed to tell me who I was the crap yes it was real but all the crap I can let that go yes in the cloud that of was, forgetting that was the last at bat yeah this at bat yeah yeah I like that a lot and we just, you know, how many times, and we've both had situations in our life that are, shall we say, regretful that it had we a chance to do them over again, we might have handled them differently, although I doubt it, you know, because that we played the cards that we were dealt and we played them the best we can. And now we live with that and move on. And not to let those sorts of things linger and bring us down, but rather to have the choice to say, I want to be something better. I hope oh, I'm in my wrong document. Let me get to this document. You know, there's a couple of quotes that I, I don't know that I've used much on the podcast, but I've used with you a lot. And one is that you are who you have been becoming. Um, that has been a life-changing quote to me, to realize I am in my life who I have been becoming. The Decisions I made, the choices I made, circumstances that came my way, all the things in my life have created a, sort of an amalgamation of the Charlie that I am now, um, which which is very understandable. And, and, and I don't know anyone would disagree with that. But what I take from that is you will be tomorrow. If, if I am who I have been becoming, I will be tomorrow who I am being today. In other words, that old trite saying, this is the first day of the rest of your life, in that I begin to make the choices today. I begin to make those choices that are good for me, that are authentic, that are in my skin choices, 
that can lead me to a next step. And I'm not afraid to evaluate anything. Everything is on the table. Oh, well, that's, I mean, I mean we, we talk about this a lot as friends because it's a very 12-step thing. You know people who've done 12 step, and still the reason they're making the choices is because what they should do. In other words, it has nothing to do with being at home in their own skin yet. And you can tell when you're at home in your own skin, then you can still make those choices. Even when you make a bad one, now you know that I still can make the good one. I love that. You know what I want to do? I'm going to take a break, and then if they don't think we've gone there yet, we're going to go philosophical. I got a great Carl Jung quote that I want to work with you on. Hi there, you're listening to The Next Chapter with Charlie, and I'm doing one of my very, very favorite things, and that's uh, interacting on a podcast, and especially with my dear friend Terry Hershey, who is, I so admire his thought, his his lifestyle, and the way he sees life. And so I'm going to, you know, Hirsch, I'm going to throw at you, I read just this morning, I was in a in an online course, and, and this quote was given by Carl Jung. Um, bit deep, but it 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 is, I think it's very powerful. And he says this, and you know, Carl Jung and the unconscious, you know, and, 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 and as you know, in, in Carl Jung, you know, he uses the iceberg metaphor that our conscious is the top of the iceberg and our unconscious, who we are, everything that drives us, all that we have been in our history of experience, childhood, adolescence, early adulthood, those are, those are all part of the unconscious that it, have not quite been articulated yet need to be examined if we are truly to be uncomfortable, if we were to be comfortable in our own skin. We understand our unconscious. So Carl Jung writes this, if we don't make the, if we don't make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our lives and we call that fate. I love that. Let me repeat it. If we don't make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our lives, and we call that fate. And that's us sort of laying the groundwork for faith. That's what I'm talking about. Managing fate is that is that we lay the groundwork for it by our own unconscious. It's a great quote. I agree with him wholeheartedly. Do you? So a couple of questions then. How much do you think a fate is predicated on our own psyches, on our own windows, on the way that we view life, and we consider that fate giving us honor or fate, you know, giving us difficulty? You know, so much of what we call fate is is predicated on ourselves. And I'm not discounting faith, you know, our fate. I keep saying faith. I'm not discounting fate, but I am saying we have so much more control than some of us want to give, than some people want to give us credit for. I mean, I mean fate as in things that literally happen? Yeah, but, you know, things that literally happen, you know, difficult things, good things. You know, I, I was trying to think of examples and I couldn't think of them. So I, I failed in that. But the way we understand it is developed within ourselves, within our own psyche. That's the way we interpret it. And and it's like my son. Let, let, let's go back to my son. And I, poor guy, I hope he doesn't listen to his podcast and get pissed at his dad for revealing things. But his difficulty in hitting, that could be fate, throwing him, you know, not curveballs, but outside sliders. And and you know, that 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 could be that that could be very negative. Although as that has turned out in his history, and he's already being mentioned at thirty one years old as a one of the newer managers in baseball, which will happen in 
four or five years because of his capacity to do that. He would not be in the position he's in right now were it not for circumstances leading him to where he just doesn't have the same catching he has he can do in his sleep. But hitting is a different game for him. It's a whole, it's a whole different thing. Well, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I'm, I have two reactions. To that one is he's doing his sleep, which is kind of interesting. But it's not doing his sleep. We're back to the replenishment part, you know, the hydration part, his rituals and practices to nurture that and nourish that. That's what allows him to do that. But he does the same thing in hitting. He works out in hitting like crazy. Right now with, with Texas mean, Rangers, no, that, that, hitting coaches are doing nothing but working with him. It's another conversation to have. But my point is, back to your thing about fate, the fate is that we assume that it's a done deal. I mean, okay, let's talk fate on a bigger picture thing. Um, I have friends in Hawaii and who are close to the people, and I've lost people where the town has burned down on Maui. In Maui, yeah. And gone, gone, okay? The point is, did that happen? Yes. Is there something about the climate that made it happen? Yes. And there's a whole bunch of questions we can ask about what occurred and what happened. Now, you, now you ask the question, what choices can I make now that will make a difference? In other words, the fate doesn't determine the capacity to make a choice that makes a difference moving forward. Repeat that for me. Worker. I'm the rescue worker at 9-11. And I stand here, unpack everything about the fate, either we did politically or what happened overseas for the people who did that. Can I unpack that? I can, and we will. As I stand here, I can either shake my fist and be pissed and shut down, or I can make a difference to one or two people who need help right there, right now. In other words, I can ask myself, what choices do I have here? I, I'm able to ask that if my capacity allows me to do so. And and what makes up capacity? I mean, is that is that a natural thing? Is that a developed thing? Is that a skill? Is developed. that a talent? Developed. It's developed. developed. If I see it only as a skill and a talent, I'm all, I'm going to be at the mercy of everybody who I think is always the best. I'll never be Tiger Woods at golf. Got it. Matter. Got it. Let's begin to wrap up with a couple of things, and 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 I and then I want I want to talk about managing fate, and I have written. Three verbs that, for me, contribute to managing fate. And that means I can't predict the uncontrollable. I mean, I just did a podcast on free will and determinism and came out on the side of free will, obviously, for me, as you know me. Um, but there are certain almost like deterministic things that we have no choice on that, you know, the stock market goes crazy and we don't have any money. You know, that just... You know, we did nothing to do that, to, to, to have anything to do with that other than invest in the market. But there are three verbs that I, 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 I'm suggesting that we can apply regarding managing fate. We can influence it, we can manage it, or we can even redirect it. So we have a, you know, it, it's the Viktor Frankl-ish, although I've gotten a little more detailed than just choice. Um, we can do something about the fate that occurs to us that we feel we had no choice on, but we still can influence it, can we not? Okay, I'm looking this up because I want to I wanna read you something I wrote. Oh, good. I love what you write. When one day in 2013, I walked across a bridge Sun shone down from a bleached blue sky. The air was cool, but our spirits didn't notice. We stand and sing under the sign the Edmund Pettus Bridge. In Selma, Alabama on Bloody Sunday, I was honored to join a group of new friends on the 13th Annual Congressional Civil Rights Pilgrimage. We were led by Representative John Lewis. 
As it turned out, I walked smack dab into an epiphany. Perhaps an epiphany walked into me. Either way, it was not in the Maya. But mm. I navigate. find that I navigate my days a little easier when I have some semblance of control, but I know this control. Giving status quo. Oh, epiphanies are not found in the same sentence. Epiphanies open our eyes and they open our heart. And gratefully, after that day, I could never be the same. Love that. I, my point is that he, fate, there was a choice for those people. They could choose what to do with fate or not. And so that alters fate, does it not? Alters it. Completely. It redirects it, at least. Whether it alters it or not, it redirects it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be courting Victor Frankl today. Yeah, yeah. That is so true. There was something that just came to my mind when you were saying that. I'm thinking of, remember uh, Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? He talked about the circle of concern and the first circle of influence. Are you familiar with, uh, with that model of his? No, no. Oh, not the top of my head. Yeah. Um, it's, picture a big circle, and there are two choices in there. There's a circle of concern, which if you focus on the circle of concern, it just grows and you have no influence because you're always, you're, 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 you're under the rule of fate and you're under the rule of circumstances. But circle of influence, if you focus on your circle of influence, let's take the tiny part of that that I can influence, that's what I need to focus my effort on. I focus my effort on the that, things I, I can influence. I threw that one in the water. It made a difference to that one. Yes. And as the more you do that, the circle of influence grows and the circle of concern recedes because you're no longer as concerned about that sort of thing because you are concerned about what you can influence and what you can make a different in, difference in. And, and I think that has a lot to do with this managing fate. Okay cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. You do make a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make in good all. What kinds of choices? I, you know, this is, this is, this is more personal than, than podcasty. What kinds of choices do you think are important to make? I, I want to in a world where dignity is embraced and kindness and compassion are real, sanctuary and healing is possible. You know who that sounds like? Oh. Jesus. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, if it does, I would definitely follow Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do. Um, uh I keep I keep coming across this image. Oh, I want to close with this image because I think it's I, I I think it's I think it's so important. And and I had a Buddhist master tell me about karma one time. And I, I don't know if it was a master, but it was a Buddhist student who had been involved in Buddhism for a good while. And we talked about karma. And you know the United States version of karma is very or karma is very transactional. It is, you do good, good will come back to you. You do evil, and evil will come back to you. In context, or in retrospect, in, 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 in concert, with the good you did, you'll get an equal good. With the bad you did, you get an equal bad. He said, that's completely wrong. That's not what it's all about. Karma is about having an aura or, or, or essence of goodness, where you just present goodness you know you 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 present a positive attitude a, a welcoming sanity peaceful accepting embracing attitude those kinds of things will come back at you because you have a mindset you have you know being comfortable in your skin you're comfortable in that sort of well-being whereas the negative karma, if you're only thinking bad things, these people are doing this, they're out to get me, I'm going to do bad, that's all you receive. And I think I think that's much of what Carl Jung was getting at with the conscious and the unconscious, is that 
who you are projecting is who you will receive. That's a that's a newer thought to me, which I, I like a lot. Yeah, I'll give you one really quick story, which is kind of fun. And Carl Jung came up with that, even though he had some interesting experiences. Do you know who his therapist was? Who is who was? You know who his therapist was? <laughs> Freud. Freud was his therapist, and Carl Jung wrote that there were two sessions that he was in with Freud. Freud had fell asleep and snored. <laughs> <laughs> One of those, it's, it's so perfect you can't even make this stuff up. It's like, uh, okay, speaking of fate, well, I'll never be anything. That's the end of that. Made Freud fall asleep. Anyway, that makes the Jung stuff. Oh. You see how it, where it came from. He yeah, had to choose, uh, which is great. Yeah, we're both so Jungian. Well, let's, you know, I think, I think I, I, I want to encourage our audience as, as we've talked practical as we can on this very philosophical discussion is that you are not stuck in circumstances. Um, they are challenging. They are, and many times they're wonderful. I mean, circumstances include all the good things that happen in our life. But they're challenging. Well, they're, they're, also, they're also real. I mean, a flood happens. It's called real water. I mean, it, it, you don't have to. You don't have to discount that. But. Right. And so it's just a matter of going in ourselves and seeing what our attitude is, and seeing how we can use that for growth, for empowerment, engagement, peace, kindness. All of those kinds of things are choices that if we make those choices, our life is just going to be a lot better off, Terry. I'll say amen. Amen. All right, Hirsch, as always, you know, it is such a treasure talking to you. Thank you for your time. I know you were writing a blog and you are a Sabbath moment and you took time to talk to us. We, we really do appreciate that. Thanks, buddy. Okay, I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.